Ladies and gentlemen, I have a little note here which says, Chairman introduces himself. Well, I'm a member of the AA. Uh, and welcome. Um, now, you may like to know that this is the first of a new, an extra, as it were, uh, to a new series of meetings that uh, is being arranged in, in the current year. And, and the first of those um, is on January the 29th, um, a debate chaired by Sir Michel Black, entitled, Is There an Alternative to the International Style for the Third World? Well, that's just a little bit of advanced publicity. Um, it's very nice to be able to say that David Hicks needs no introduction and mean it. Indeed, he's so well known and successful that he's a phenomenon. He's certainly the best known interior decorator designer in this country, probably in the Western world and with Aeroflot among his clients, very likely amongst a large section of the Eastern Bloc as well. He must also be a brave man. I almost introduced him as Daniel Hicks. Though as lion's dens go, I think the AA is not what it was. There was a time when Mr Hicks would have been considered not brave but foolhardy to have ventured here to address us in our territory on the subject he's made his own. It is not that the lions are any less fierce. They're fiercer than ever but less united, much of their fierceness being reserved for each other. <laughs> the purest holy grail of the thirties has vanished, not into limbo, but into the wings, with Corb, I suspect, waiting for a revival. You can see it coming, can't you? Neo Corbusier. Eclecticism is with us with a vengeance, no longer a mortal sin. Actually, it's always been with us, and David Hicks knows this very well. It's one of the secrets of his astonishing career. The decorating and designing of interiors is almost as old as architecture, and there's a long tradition of this work being carried out by others than the architect of the building. Architects tend to look askance at this practice. We think of ourselves as brilliant interior designers, the only ones capable of dealing with the insides of our buildings. Sometimes this is true, but it's an unpalatable fact that not all architects are skillful interior designers as well. There are great buildings where inside and out are a total concept and where it would be unthinkable for anyone but the architect to be involved in the design process. This is perhaps an ideal for which we strive, but don't always succeed. But I'm keeping you from Mr Hicks. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Hicks. Can everybody hear? It's a quarter of a century since I was last in this building, and I was a student at the GLC Central School of Arts and Crafts nearby in Holborn. And some of my friends were then students here. One of the great misunderstandings professionally today is that architects supposedly despise interior designers, and that we, in return, loathe architects. <coughs> well, we have very practical living truth that that is... Uh, uh, <coughs> we have a total example that that is totally untrue by the fact that Mr. Manasse has just very kindly introduced me in far too flattering a way because he and I are old friends having combined as professionals, me knowing my place, the inferior professional, working for the great man on a house together for clients in Richmond. I always prefer having an architect, interior designer relationship, but from the beginning, so often, the client, whether they be a corporation or whether they be a married couple or a bachelor girl, whatever it is, the client, they so often only think of the detailed interior after they have almost com completed the building. And this, of course, ends in disaster. To be brought in as an interior design consultant right from the word go 
is of vital importance. I know that almost all the architects I've worked with on different projects have in fact ended up by appreciating our specialized knowledge of interior design and I certainly have learnt and benefited tremendously from working with them, understanding the architecture from the initial conception, working together with an enormous amount of cooperation and coordination. I'd like to define the difference between interior decoration and interior design. I see it in this way. Interior decoration is the art of achieving the maximum with the minimum. It's the art of making the most of your house, your rooms and your possessions. And generally speaking, I think it's true to say that an interior decorator who is not also a designer deals with private houses He's a person, she is a person of imagination and good taste, of flair for colour and furniture arrangement. On the other hand, interior design is concerned with internal architecture, with planning, with space allocation, and with the creation of furniture specifically intended for a contemporary private interior and for contract work in offices, hotels, restaurants, etc. Nobody, I think, could describe Elsie de Wolf, Mrs. Somerset Maugham, Billy Baldwin, or Boudin as interior designers, nor could they describe Sir John Soane, William Morris, John Bannenberg, or possibly myself, purely as interior decorators. Interior designers can also be interior decorators, but I think it is true to say that there are many interior decorators who are not interior designers. Besides being both an interior decorator and an interior designer, I'm also under contract to design home furnishings, a beastly Americanism, but I can't find a better English equivalent, for many different manufacturers in such far apart countries as France and Japan. And I also have a series of shops bearing my name in France, Belgium, Switzerland, Holland, South Africa, and Spain, with nearly finalized plans for this year to open also in Austria, Germany, Norway, and Italy. And I'm, <clears throat> at the same time, I'll stop talking about myself in a minute, I'm also a product designer of uh, apparel, men's ties, swimwear, women's headscarves, luggage, and so forth. The diversity of my design practice produces a stimulating and fresh approach to each new assignment, whether it be for a drawing room, for kitchen wear, or for sports shirts. I must confess, I do consider myself to be extremely fortunate in the breadth of my work, which seems to enable me, perhaps, to avoid that staleness which is the constant enemy of innovation. For example, on Monday morning, I will design a tourist office for the Algerian government, while in the afternoon, I'll design umbrellas for a Japanese manufacturer. On Tuesday morning, I'll work on an office in Doha as an interior designer, and in the afternoon, work as a product designer, approving and modifying my designs for an English range of kitchenware. Then on Wednesday morning, I'll work with a French architect 
on the reconstruction of and architectural additions to a house in the south of France. After this, I'll design further models for my collection of men's shoes being made in Switzerland. On Thursday morning, I'll vet the plans for a new shop layout. And in the afternoon, complete the designs for a range of sculptured carpets being manufactured in Hong Kong. I see an awful lot of people smiling. They obviously don't believe a word I'm saying. <laughs> On Friday morning, I will proofread my sixth book. And later in the day, I'll probably make some notes for luggage designs. Needless to say, I am backed in London by a young, enthusiastic design studio. And in all the countries where I have shops, I also have interior design offices with absolutely splendid associate designers. Naturally, it'd be impossible to cope with the number of different design activities and assignments that I've told you about without their superb professional cooperation. Interior design is the art of creating a truly suitable interior using a discerning and disciplined eye in order to reflect the character and personality of each individual client and for them selecting furniture, fabrics, wall coverings and carpets in the contemporary idiom and showing that all fit into the best of modern interior design. Interior decoration has existed from the earliest times. More recently, apart from Daniel Maho, Robert Adam, William Morris and others, interior decoration was not carried out by specialized professionals until the 20s. Architects have usually concerned themselves with the structure only. And it was the cabinet makers and upholsterers who put together the rather sparse 18th century interiors. In the 19th century, it was the upholsterers and drapers who pervade the ingredients of the overfilled rooms. And not until the 1920s did the first professionals who dealt exclusively with interior decoration appear. Among these were Elsie de Wolf, Mrs. Maum, and Jean-Michel Franck in Paris, who began by working for their friends and ended by leaving their mark indelibly on the decoration scene throughout the world for the next 60 years. So Winston Churchill said, without design, sorry, without tradition, Design is a flock of sheep without a shepherd. Each period evolves out of some preceding one, and many new ideas are sparked off by previous solutions. It's fascinating to me that one of the oldest stone buildings in the world, the tomb of Zosa in Egypt, because of its severe straight lines and stringent proportions, looks like the most advanced building of our age. Like all other arts, decoration is enormously derivative. In exactly the same way as the classical orders of architecture have been used in many varying forms for 3,000 years, I find that decorative motifs have recurred throughout history. There is not one motif in use today that cannot be related to a derivative source. In decoration today, we use chairs, tables, and window coverings, which in principle have hardly changed since the Egyptians. The actual material and details have altered, but the problems of arrangement, comfort, and lighting are basically the same. Although my present interest is mainly concerned with modern interiors, 
furniture and fabrics, I draw continually on experience gained in working with fine furniture and traditional fabrics in period houses. Modern interiors, to my mind, are as dependent on atmosphere as traditional ones. The fault of many interiors of today is that designers too often neglect the necessity of atmosphere, character, contrast, and pattern. The reason why decoration is such an absorbing subject is that all through history it has reflected the character of the person using a particular background. Examples have survived to show us how empresses, great lovers, and statesmen lived. The small, intimate background is, of course, less well known if it dates from before the 19th century. Our own age is heavily documented by photography, films, magazines, and books. The principles of great historic interiors and outstanding modern ones apply to the smallest flat. Good period and good modern interiors have one thing in common, style. Style produces atmosphere, and if the style is right, then the interior has taste. I cannot attempt to differentiate between good and bad taste. What you or I consider to be good, kitsch, vulgar, or bad may well differ. It is a highly personal point of view. <coughs> People are often amazed at clients who have a considerable interest in decorating and yet employ a professional interior decorator. One of the aspects of our job is making up people's minds for them. I know how important this can be because when I do a room for myself, the wide range of possibilities is even more overwhelming than to the non-professional. And I long for somebody to make up my mind for me. People who employ decorators should never be accused of having no ideas or not having strong feelings about an interior themselves. They are looking for perfection and above all for reassurance. Personally, I never like to work for people willing to give me a completely free hand. I strongly believe that my job is to interpret and carry out the ideas of each client and to arrive at an interior that is absolutely right for its use and the personalities concerned. I like it when they insist on using a particular modern chair, have a horror of certain colors, and have strong feelings about the kind of atmosphere they want to create. For this reason, the most important factor in deciding how to treat your rooms is to have a clear, decisive attitude towards the possibilities that apply to your particular needs. Never be afraid to use someone else's idea if it really applies to the use you're going to put it, but always try to adapt rather than slavishly copy. A few minutes ago I mentioned taste. Taste may perhaps, in our present world of greed and destruction, sound somewhat frivolous but everyone who buys even the smallest piece of furniture or a tie does so but by choosing between alternatives. This choice is governed by their taste. To have taste is not expensive. Often the more expensive of two alternatives is less acceptable to those who are visually aware, people with taste, taste, good or bad, a 
affects us in every detail of life. The clothes we wear, anything we buy, the books we read, the films we see, all are governed by taste. What is really important is that people elevate their taste so that they can judge not only their own problems, but general problems of taste and design. It is amazing to me how few people bother to do this and how very many people there are with no taste, either good or bad. If only they'd have downright bad taste, something definite, or any feelings about it and all that it affects. It's only too evident when we look into the homes of our politicians, musicians and actors, with of course notable exceptions. It's even more obvious when we look around at what is happening to our own country and the rest of the world today. Everywhere there is total disregard for preservation and for really fine architectural conceptions and a high standard of design in manufactured goods. I'm particularly interested in preserving those once beautiful parts of England which are threatened daily by new developments, almost all of them ill-considered and badly sighted. Under our eyes, every village, small town and city is being villainously, vinyl, I can't say it, villainously wrecked. It needed Malraux and the general to achieve what has been done in preserving and controlling Paris to a very considerable degree. But even they failed to prevent architectural slaughter in Bordeaux and other parts of France. It's all part of taste and visual awareness. What we allow by disinterest, disinterest, disinterestedness or weakness, our children will have to live with. The great sadness is that there's no leadership in this and other countries. In the past, taste and enlightened patronage <coughs> filtered down from the top. Now, the butcher is influenced by the ideal home exhibition because the elite or moneyed classes are unenlightened. In the 18th century, shops of tradesmen were beautiful but the premises of their modern counterparts are a disgrace, not to mention the appalling horrors of supermarket buildings. The nouveau riche have no taste. Generally speaking, they merely ape pathetically the conventional ideas of the past. How many millionaires have built great new houses? heads of state of the world nowadays have little interest in style and consequently the worst possible example is set. In the past these people had immense, an immense sense of quality and they helped to create the taste of the period. But to return more specifically to interior design which is predominantly concerned with taste and style, I would say that having taste means that every detail of your life and the way you live is selected with immense care. It is amazing how important it is to choose even the color of the soap and the towels for your bathroom, the design of a letterbox, the shape of a glass, a reading light, a picture frame, a bookshelf, a fork. All these things are borne in mind by people who are visually aware. People who use their taste to discriminate between one alternative and another. It is what they buy and how they group their possessions together. It is the way they use color, arrange furniture, upholster their chairs, flowers they grow, and the way they serve their food. I know of a small flat full of atmosphere created with objects of enormous character, none of which cost more than two or three pounds. The result is exciting as any fine collection. Obviously the possessions are humble in quality and none of them been more than a hundred years old. But they were selected with a discriminating eye 
seeking our textures, colors, and shapes which would relate to each other in an interesting and exciting way. It's a very personal and eccentric collection relying on once commonplace articles of daily use but arranged and lit as though they were antiquities of great value. I've seen countless collections of incredibly valuable furniture, pictures and objets de vertu, where I long to remove three quarters of the contents and inject something simple and fresh of today to give life and counterpoint to the individually beautiful pieces. By being massed together in too great a quantity, without discernment, rooms housing collections such as these become like an over-rich meal with too many courses of different flavors, sauces, and wines. I have a client in America who built the most simple basic house of excellent proportions and with the absolute minimum of furniture. In a sensible but unusual way, he rejected all the paraphernalia and frippery with which his friends usually surround themselves. He is considered an eccentric by them, but to me, he has great sense. It is never the value of objects or pictures placed together in the same room or the quality of furniture which is used that gives style and which shares a personal taste. It is their selection and the way they are interrelated. It's the contrast, texture, or color. It's one object in unexpected juxtaposition with another. For instance, a hard edge painting above a Byzantine bowl or a stainless steel glass topped st table against a raw 15th century rough stone wall which produces magic. Taste is formed by looking by being aware of how other, the other people choose, arrange, and decorate. All of us form our taste, in some cases, from what we were surrounded by and what we admired as a child, or by reacting to it and forming a taste of our own, which is different from that of our parents. In reacting to taste, or a lack of it, which we find unsympathetic or boring, we are bound to form a new one by looking at the solutions of others. I know that as a young man of 18, I had no taste. I'd been brought up in a rather ordinary, rather dull house, and being particularly visually aware, I began to look and admire, to accept and reject the way other people to whom taste and style mattered more than to my own parents. I am now able to accept or reject with an immediacy. And I think the layman's great difficulty is that he's not able to react instantly to alternatives. He's too inclined to be bewildered by the choice which is now multitudinous in furnishing fabrics furniture, but it is only a matter of being sufficiently aware and interested and of training your eyes to look at things clearly and ruthlessly. It's a question of accepting or rejecting an idea which is right or wrong for the purpose in mind. I'm often asked what are the most important elements in interior design and decoration. Although it is difficult to be categoric, I believe that color is the most important single factor. Secondly, the arrangement of furniture, and thirdly, the lighting. But perhaps more important than any of these is the ability to be decisive. It's important to know exactly what you're aiming for, whether you are doing your own room or whether you're acting as a professional 
advisor. Perhaps you'd like me to tell you how I tackle a new commission to design the interior of a private house. I first attempt to get the fullest and most honest brief out of the client. This will include such practical considerations as the ages of the children, the number of people in the family, and how much furniture from a previous house or flat is to be used, the likes and dislikes of the clients with regard to color, their interest or disinterest in modern paintings and furniture, and of course the scope of the budget. During this contact, a fair amount of diplomacy and psychological assessment is necessary. Then, along with making exciting proposals with conviction, very quickly a plan, a style, and an atmosphere comes to mind. And through enthusiastic verbal descriptions, probably at this stage without any fabric or carpet samples, I put over my proposals. Naturally, <coughs> these proposals have got to land on fertile ground. And if the first scheme, the first atmosphere which I am proposing is clearly not being sympathetically received, it is necessary very quickly to think of alternative colors, alternative furniture arrangements, and try and regain the confidence of the client. Three or four years ago, I did a number of interiors in America, and using my well-tried briefing techniques, on an elderly American millionaires. I asked for her color preferences and her ideas about purchasing antique and modern furniture. After three minutes of stunned silence, she looked at me and said, what the hell am I paying you for if I got to tell you how to decorate my house? I immediately realized that what I'd been told about American interior designers must be true. And I quickly transformed myself into a dictator of taste and concrete ideas. She was delighted when I told her that her wall-to-wall -wall carpeting must go, although it was only a year old. She must have parquet de Versailles with the David Hicks rug on it. That her elaborate French wall panelling should be covered by stretched chamois leather. That her crystal chandelier must be replaced by a bank of ultra-modern eyeball spotlights and the, the carefully created patina of the gilt frames of her impressionists was be changed for ones of satin finished steel. Later that day, I went to see a European client, also living in New York. She had taken Claire Booth Lucy's apartment on Park Avenue, and the floor throughout the entire flat was made of Parquet de Versailles. I naturally advised her to have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. <laughs> Being properly briefed is also, of course, vitally essential in interior design connected with contract work. Another question that's often put to me is what is the most exciting job I've ever undertaken? My reply is always the ones on which I'm working at the time. Today there are two such jobs. One is the ugliest house in Switzerland. This is because of the deathly Swiss architecture of the early 50s, where every single design decision was, by my standards, totally unsympathetic and wrong. Therefore, long before we can begin to think about interior decoration, the house has to be altered structurally to a very considerable degree. And naturally, I am working with a Swiss architect. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
sum up the role of the professional decorator and interior designer, they should be a person with a sharp eye for architectural detail, someone who delights in color and texture, and someone who revels in immaculate detail, someone of imagination and versatility, and someone who can interpret the needs of his clients, but who, having created the right background, leaves room for adaptability. I'll now show you one or two slides of interiors and details, which I will talk about as we look at them. Thanks so much. This is a very ungainly studio room in Paris, which an American client... Can I turn this up? Which an American client wanted made into a living room. She had bought this fireplace, which is late 17th century, and <clears throat> I designed this printed linen, very large-scale damask, as I felt it complemented the chimney, and it seemed to give scale and warmth to this otherwise overwhelmingly cold, tall, bare space. Thank you. This is a highly traditional living room in London, looking over Hyde Park. The client, as you can see, had nice 18th century furniture and pictures and objects. And so it seemed to me suitable to do traditional 18th century curtain treatments but at the same time, we introduced the occasional modern element. This is another view of that same room in Paris. Looking back, the fireplace is behind us. It's not always easy to mix motifs and patterns together, but I think that certainly for me and for the client, the result here seemed to work in an unexpected but reasonably successful way. This is a bathroom in an 18th century house. The paneling has been stippled to resemble granite. The bath placed in the middle of the room, and as you can see, it's been furnished as there it were a study. Carpet design I took from some old Iranian mosaic designs. This is an 18th century paneled country house bedroom where I created a four-poster effect simply by hanging the pelmet and the curtains from the ceiling. There are no posts at all. It's a perfectly ordinary divan. Nice hard edge painting by Bruce Tippett, English painter, in a house in the Bahamas designed by Robert Stokes. The exterior and the internal walls are made of concrete which was mixed with the sand from the beach. You can see the beginning of the beach outside. It is a typical, uh, I, I mean, it's a suitable building, I think, for uh, as a beach house. This is a restaurant that we designed about two years ago, and I used a 
completely blue and white theme and utilized these old French printed cottons. The blocks existed from, 18, <coughs> from 1810 and hadn't been used since then, and we revived them. And in all, I used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different patterns, all in the same area, but they were all united by their blue and white coordination. And then it's always a problem in hotels and restaurants when the budget is used up to know how to make the walls look interesting. And so I went to Habitat and bought the cheapest blue and white china that I could find and arranged them on the walls in different geometric patterns. This is a room in London, very undistinguished architecturally. With Colin Golding, the architect, I built out these bookcases to try and give it more a more interesting contour and used a very busy geometric carpet to give the atmosphere and the character that I referred to earlier and grouped architectural drawings together on the two facing walls. An adjoining room in the same apartment, you can see I've brought the same geometric carpet through and <coughs> altered the doors, taking them up to rather nice tall proportions. This window, in fact, is a typical 30s critter window with a horizontal bar, just where I'm pointing, and two vertical ones. Normally, the Holland roller blind, which you see there, is pulled down just below that horizontal bar, which gives the impression of simply two vertical lines, which are then covered in front by these stainless steel grills. For the purposes of the photograph, the blind had to be pulled right down. This is a room in the Hyde Park Hotel in London, in a suite of rooms which we redesigned about two years ago. A very sort of nothing room architecturally, and so I thought that a, a rather in-between kind of atmosphere was required, so it's neither modern nor traditional. This is a room in New York, um, rather nice 18th century pine panelling, which never would have been stripped originally and the clients insisted on retaining it, although I personally disliked the, the architectural detail. I think it was mocked up in the 20s. Quite exciting to see a galvanized iron bucket with dried flowers in it on a rather good mid-18th century gilded console table. Example of contract design, offices of a steel corporation in New York. Very dark anthracite gray tweed on the walls and stainless steel cladding for the structural columns and a piece of red lacquer slung between them to form a reception desk top. A lot of curiously assembled eight, late 17th and 18th century objects. The chimney is interesting. It's by Batty Langley, and it's 1742. The peacock is Mogul, late 17th century Indian version. And the room is octagonal 
And so I designed a geometric carpet with a border in an octagonal shape. This is a room in Holland, 17th century Dutch house. The only thing 17th century there are the beams. Um, Suffolk rush matting. An exciting, actually, in the room to have all these things of today because the windows are very, very nice 17th century stained glass. This is a wallpaper, my design, and you can see that it was a, a rather inexpensive job. There was some nasty uh, panelling of some sort there. We went straight over it and even covered the parson's table in the wallpaper. This is a bathroom in London where I used a white slatted ceiling and tweed for the walls, just stuck on like wallpaper, and for the bath panels. I think that's the microphone. Um, <clears throat> and the floor was in fact made of panels of blockboard, a foot by two feet, covered in the same tweed and staple gunned onto the back. So they were in fact loose tiles of blockboard covered in fabric. This is in Athens. They find Salvador Dali. Uh, a modern steel and glass top dining table and then heavily black lacquered traditional Queen Anne style dining chairs. And here is one of the room dividers, which in fact is a curtain made of chromiumed bead, chains of, of, of chromium beads. Um, <clears throat> these, in fact, these curtains on this four poster which was in the middle of the room with a swan chair at each corner. The curtains are made of some sheets which I designed for the American market. And then we did this room setting as a promotional photograph. A room in another house in Holland with walls covered in brown felt and this braided detail. The red was the same fabric as the curtains and then two lines of black on either side of it. Well, this room produces more reactions from people than anything else I've ever been involved in. It's a typical New York uh, rather inexpensive apartment block with these overwhelming vertical and horizontal beams, and it belonged to the guy who made my wallpapers at the time, and he wanted it to be a showpiece for his product, and so we used this enormously overscaled geometric design and painted the beams, as you can see, in a highly lacquered orange, and used a geometric carpet of a Celtic inspiration with it. And that's just a promotional shot showing more uh, towels and uh, sheets and so on in my design. There we go. Again, using sheets to make a four poster bed. In this instance, because of the practical details of a store ceiling with the fire extinguishers and lights and air conditioning, it stood on a square framework, but it still was just a simple divan bed. A closer view of the same, same bedroom setting. 
So this bed, in fact, is in probably one of the smallest bedrooms that you could possibly put a double bed into. And there is only room, and only just room, as you can see, for a bedside table on either side. And then you get the wall and the window wall there. But <clears throat> it does give a tremendous sense of style and atmosphere to an otherwise totally characterless room. This is an 18th century uh, bathroom in France. And as you can see, I've placed the bath in between the bathroom proper and, and the dressing room. This is the Gestetna showrooms, which we did, which aren't very far from here. And we were luckily given the, the whole job right from the beginning of, of not only redeploying the space, but of how the uh, name should be illuminated at night, the lighting of the actual entrance, and so on. And this is an interior of the open plan showroom space, which we then closed up. Having opened it up, we then closed it up again with these semi-transparent smoke glass partitions. Well, this is what I call a chimney escape. Um, it's a directoire marble chimney in a, in a simple late 18th century house with typical tiled floor. This is another shot of that room we looked at in Athens. And here again is this bead curtain room divider. The room is quite long. We're about in the middle of it, and so we have the same depth coming this way. And it was originally five small rooms. And when I first saw them, I said to the client, you, you've got to knock these all into one. And you've got a large collection of late 19th century Greek paintings and so on. And so he said yes. And then, of course, having knocked it all down, I discovered that because he dines in that end, and because he sits here, and because drinks and so on go on the other end, we needed to divide it. So we did two of these semi-transparent room dividers. <coughs> this is a room painted by Rex Whistler for the war. And I'm showing it merely because I like the effect of objects against a background. I like putting things on top of each other. It gives a richness, I think. This is an oast house in Sussex. Suffolk rush matting. Nice 17th century oak furniture. Some modern tables. A rather vulgar lamp. Well, it is really um, high gloss paint. There are, <coughs> the, the, there are people in, uh, in Switzerland and in Paris who do do what we really should mean by lacquer, which is, as you know, layers of paint which are rubbed down, allowed to dry, more is put on, rubbed down, and so on, the traditional way of doing lacquer. Um, <coughs> but this is not a very practical solution for most people. So normally, when I want to do lacquered walls, if the client can afford it, I will use a lacquered uh, plastic uh, fabric, which is then applied to panels and put onto the wall. Or I will paint the walls with a matte paint and then what I call lacquer them with a coach varnish. Maybe put two coats of that. <laughs> so it's a high paint yes. But you actually get a better effect if you do it with matte paint and then apply your very high gloss varnish.
rather than a glass pen. I have another question as well. Oh. Um, after taking the exam, you usually can't think of what to do with the water, so they leave the wine. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think that's why we endeavour it. <laughs> that's, that's where we come in. <laughs> the, the argument goes that if you leave it all white, it shows off anything which you're going to put against it. But I, I feel personally that you're opt- as architects, we opt out. Like well, you must work more with interior designers. <laughs> Somebody in the back. Yeah. Plants. Right. How important do I think plants yes. are in an interior? The limitation of this or the introduction of them? I mean, the importance of plants within an interior, the fact that they grow, mean the only living thing within an interior. Yeah. Well, I, I very much like plants used in interiors, but um, I don't like those sort of uh, sick looking rubber plants who seem to dry clean as windows. If you're going to have in door plants, you've got to know quite a bit about it. I mean, you can learn about it by a book about it. But they, they've got to be really marvellous looking. They've got to be healthy, well fed. You've got to oil and wash the leaves. I think plants do, obviously, um, uh, complement, um, you know, internal art. Um, profile and, and a marvellous kind of uh, feeling of, of, of growth and of life, yes. But they've got to be good plants, and they've got to be the right scale. Would there be a point where you would not introduce them? Would there be a point where I wouldn't want to introduce them? Well, I don't want them in every room. I think, you know, that each room should have its own atmosphere, and although it mustn't be a shock going from one to another, uh, you do want, I think, to feel that you're you know, you're, you're, you're in the, uh, the dining area, you're in the dining room, or you're in the living room. So you don't have to want to have plants, to my mind, in both the dining room and the living room. So following that concept, how much do you think that the exterior should come into the room? If you, for example, have a slide path, how much of the outside landscape should be introduced into the room? Well, not too much, particularly in a northern country. Why don't you as being an architect, you have a client with a practical problem, a fixed budget, you have a tendering system, and you have a, a, joy, a joyous relationship with the people that are trying to get the thing finished. Can you explain exactly how you go about getting your work made? Well, we work in, 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 in almost the same way. Um, we, we uh, first of all, <coughs> just devise the scheme um, <coughs> You know, out loud with the client, and then we uh, return the next day with our subcontractors, our electricians, our painters, our upholsterers, carpet layers, and we obtain all the exact quantities, and we, we then submit um, something which is just as, if I may say, just as professional as your um, budget that you, you submit on, on the creation of an actual building. Do you find you can get the sort of right the intimacy with the, with the attractive? Some of the work seems so detailed and specific that it would require a very sort of intimate relationship with whoever you were asking to make something, which architects somehow don't seem to be able to achieve. Um, <clears throat> you know, without examining each shot in detail, it's very hard to um, reply to accurately on that. But. I mean, should we take one example? Would you be referring to those tables covered in snakeskin? Right. No. And that or getting, getting um, a, a high-gloss finish on some beans or a bit of furniture, or just collecting a few pots from Paris and taking them to mm-hmm. Persia or wherever they're being taken from. Mm. Um, well, it, all those things are... are it, it, it's possible to estimate all those things. I mean, if you're talking about the antique accessories, you can go to five antique dealers and you can either take away photographs and a price list or you can have things on approval. So you can arrive at a situation where you can meet a client at 10 o'clock on a certain day and say, 
right, it's going to cost this much to lacquer your beams. Here are your uh, objects. They, 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 they come to X pounds. You can give a very clear idea of what the overall budget will be. Do you see uh, interior design as a uh, luxury or a necessity? Well, <coughs> uh, I don't see it as a necessity, no. And I don't, on the other hand, see it as a super luxury. I think it's, um, it's important to people who care, and it's totally unimportant to people who don't. It just depends whether you're visually aware or not. I got the impression that a lot of your projects were extremely high uh, um, contract, very high cost. Uh, have you done uh, any work on lower cost uh, commissions? Unfortunately, I've never been asked to, no. no. I'd welcome it. I'd very much like to do, for instance, a show flat for a council, which could give examples of how to furnish simple, low-cost housing. But what do you Very do to fulfill this wish? Pardon? What do you do to fulfill this wish? Do you charge them less for uh, your services? <laughs> <laughs> I'd do it free. If it was a big enough project, if it was going to help enough people, I would, I, would, um, I would do it simply out of the interest of doing it. I've done it for television programs. We, we took a, a typical room in a, in, a, uh, in a Lambeth block, I think it was about 24 stories high, and we did actually do the exercise of rearranging the existing furniture of a very down to earth family, although they were on the 23rd floor. Um, <laughs> and we televised it. The result was interesting. Does your office work a lot from coloured visuals to show a client, or do you mainly show them the fabrics? We, we use coloured visuals for all contract work, offices, hotels, restaurants, anything like that. Generally speaking, when we're doing private work, we don't. We, we, we do it verbally, because we, we reckon that... Um, if they've come to us in the first place, they know sufficiently about our style and the, and the way we do things. And, you know, I have published a few books and they've seen photographs that they, you know, they, they, they can get the complete impression of what, what we're talking about verbally. Uh, there was a time when architects were in the habit of sort of taking out the whole end end wall of a room and filling it with glass, either to let light in, or else mm -hmm. to call it, to make it into a so-called inside-outside space. Um, do you agree with this? Um, and if you don't, what do you do about it? And otherwise, how do you, if you destroy the enclosure of a space, how do you recreate it? Well, I showed you one example of a, of a, of a long, narrow um, space, which was, in fact, divided into four or five rooms. And, and we took down those walls in order to give a big area, which would be the equivalent of this wall to that wall. Uh, and then I felt the necessity, the need, to put back semi-partitions uh, to, to, to again cre create you know, three spaces. But it still had the, the semi-transparent effect, which was what I think <coughs> the client and I wanted. I was referring more to windows and how do you handle those? Inside. What, if you, um, are we talking about a traditional room where you say, let's make this a wall of glass? Yeah, if somebody was, did want to do that, I mean, it has been done. <laughs> I think that's all right, that's what they want to do. Um, and you, you, you've then got the problem of curtaining the entire area. I don't think you'll be achieving very much in, in a traditional building. <laughs> Flexibility. You provide a structure, perhaps, and then 
the arrangement of, of walls or activity in the building can change over the years, maybe totally different use of the building. And I wondered if uh, that has sort of affected interior design a lot, or, not. or your work. I mean, presumably, one could, um, I think it's the thing that's coming in a bit is a house is where you have partitions which you can rearrange in different ways to form different planning in, in a flat, say. Mm -hmm. and that would be one, that would be really interior design, I suppose. Yes, well, I think, I think all, all, of, all of that's very, very exciting and very interesting. I always think uh, there are a number of practical things which limit it very much. I mean, if you are going to have movable petitions, um, if you've got the design right in the first place, if the architect has, that is, um, there shouldn't be any need to move, but all right, supposing that you do want to move them, you're then surely dependent on felt tiles on the floor, which are going to work within the new modules you're creating. Otherwise, the partition, having been down on a wall-to-wall -wall carpet, is going to be, I mean, also pressed down. I mean, it's, it's not possible, really, is it? Architects do I admire, presumably, because yeah. I don't dislike any architects. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I admire very much um, Mies van der Rohe. Uh, I think it's easier to talk about dead architects, don't you? <laughs> There's so many <coughs> prominent people. Um, I, I admire uh, Lloyd Wright tremendously. I think he, he, he was an absolute genius and, and seemed to liberate a whole kind of conception for the following generation. <coughs> I, In the back of my question really is what, uh, what sort of uh, feelings do you have in the direction modern architecture is going? I mean, what, if um, modern architects haven't been really very sympathetic to interior designers, it was Frank Lloyd Wright who called them <coughs> interior desecrators. But you know, I think at the time he was speaking, he was probably right. You see, it was very much in its infancy when he made them remark. And there was almost total lack of coordination between architects and designers. And again, to somebody like Stanford White in America was conscious of the interior. But it is true that architects, by and large, in the last 40 years, haven't been either interested in the interior or in interior decorators. Um, no, I, I don't think, think that's a true statement, or rather. There are a number. I mean, uh, Philip Johnson, I, I happen to know quite well, um, he's got a very considered series of interiors. Mm. But he's very much an exception. Yes, I suppose he is an exceptional architect. <laughs> um, I know an awful lot of architects, you know, people who were here actually at the AA when I was studying down the road who were very interested in interiors. You're particularly interested in interiors. Could you explain your preoccupation with positive policy in the last <laughs> <laughs> Yes, very easily, um, <clears throat> because um, I think that bathrooms have been terribly ignored by, by everybody and, and, and until fairly recently. And the ordinary, I mean, the normal thing for anyone to do is in a rectangular room, they will put the bath in the corner and they'll put the basin just off-center from the window, and usually the taps 
or at the end of the bath, so that as you lie in the bath, you look at the loo. Now, um, I started by centering the bath on the wall and centering the basin under the window and making sure that the loo was at the head of the bath so that you don't lie and look at what is one of the most ugly everyday articles of use. And then I got intrigued by the idea of, in a bigger room, going back to the early bathrooms where they are in the center of rooms. I won't go into antique bathrooms because that's another whole realm, but when the bath was first introduced into country houses in this country, in about 1890, 1880, they were <clears throat> merely put, there was one on the ground floor, and it was only used by the men of the house. And there wasn't a bathroom, it was an old house, and so it was put in the middle of the room, which is where the bathtub had always been, the hip <laughs> bath had always been put previously. Then when the bathroom moved upstairs, for the woman of the house, they simply continued the idea of taking an X bedroom and putting the bath in the middle. And I think if the room is big enough, it's an extremely nice way to arrange a bath, and you can then <coughs> furnish the room around the bath. Hmm? <coughs> it's much easier to clean the bath, absolutely. You can get at it from four sides. Well, I don't think you saw the plumbing draping all around. I mean, it was. <laughs> the, 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 the most reasonable way to avoid having a situation is the plumbing. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. In my bathroom. Yeah. You had it in the middle of the room. You've got the main problems trying to get the waste and things to a mm -hmm. stack. Yes, yeah, I know. There, there, there are problems, and obviously, very often one can't do it. In fact, the two that I showed you were in old houses, 18th century houses, where there was an immense space between the floor of the bathroom and the ceiling of the room below. So it's perfectly possible to, to do it. If it's, a, if it's a modern room, then obviously one would put the, the head of the bath against the wall and have it projecting into the room like this. So that all your services are by the wall anyway. You've still got the space to walk around it. I'm going to start charging in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like sunken baths. I think they're vulgar, impractical, and extremely expensive and, and, and very, very di really difficult to install. You, know, you get that effect in the hall. Sociologically, how do you see the, I mean, the importance of an interior designer in the third world, for example? Well, I think interior designers are very important um, people to be uh, consulted on all the, the, the growing uh, public areas. I mean, the airports, universities, hospitals, community centers, all of these vast areas which, which are being uh, constructed every second uh, it seems to me that, it, on the whole, the interior design aspect has been somewhat ne neglected. So I think we've got an important contribution to make there. Providing we're brought in either by the authority or by the architect. But isn't one always confined with the fact that in new countries, like, I don't know, Brazil, in Africa, the architects are mainly in charge of a whole building. I mean, they don't consider the importance of an interior design at all. Well, then I think that they should um, instigate interior design courses in their architectural um, colleges. Now, if there are no more questions, I think David Hicks probably talked himself dry. And, uh, uh, and it is getting on, so perhaps we ought to close the meeting. Um, I would like to say myself, just as winding up, that it's been uh, a fascinating evening, uh, certainly for me. And the fascinating thing about it is that all of us in this room are, in a sense, engaged 
um, in the same processes of trying to um, trying to deal with things three dimensionally. And David Hicks has shown us a facet of it that um, far too few architects uh, not only know anything about whether they like it or not is another matter, but not only know very little about it, but um, don't consider important. Um, and socially, obviously, it's of the greatest importance because um, it is dealing intimately in the spaces in which people live. And it's something that architects <coughs> must know something about or um, be prepared to collaborate on. And, as I say, David Hicks has shown us in detail a facet of this process of dealing with three dimensions. I'm only sorry that the fountainhead of architecture hasn't um, uh, produced rather more arguments than we've heard this evening uh, to show the other side of the picture. Uh, but that's not David Hicks's fault, which has been, and it's been a most stimulating evening, and can we show our appreciation in the normal way?